many, many years, since his teenage years, in organizing peace, justice, labor, and environmental issues. Um, he was a co-founder of the National U.S. Green Party in 1984. He's been called the original Green New Dealer. Uh, that was the theme he ran on uh, when he ran for New York governor in 2010. He also ran for governor in 06 and, I'm no, sorry, in 2014 and 2018. He ran for Senate in 06 and um, has been asked by many to even uh, run for the presidency in 2020. He's expected to form an exploratory committee on that in the next few weeks. I just want to mention that uh, third parties are an important uh, part of the debate. I think uh, they get issues into the debate that might not have been there. And for example, we have the ban on fracking in New York, and we have the $15 minimum wage. I think this is one of the major forces we have to thank for these results. Thank you. Yeah, so you know I'm crazy. I, you know, I didn't plan on running for president, but a lot of Greens asked me to. But uh, I think the point of the paper that I wrote up, and I got some copies here, is that, uh, as Alan was saying, that uh, you don't have to win the office to win the debate and make changes. I mean, the ban on fracking when I ran in 2010 in the state, the main, most of the environmental groups were saying, oh, it's the bridge to the renewable future. We'll, we'll replace gas with coal. And now we know from some research at Cornell it's is as bad in terms of greenhouse gas emissions because methane is much more potent. And the $15 minimum wage. You know, actually, I wanted to debate Cuomo this time because if I didn't win governor, I'd go back to UPS, because they cut my pensions, that's a whole other story, they changed ERISA, but I can go back to work, but I lose my seniority, I start over, I would have been working at 10, 40 an hour. And he's running around the state saying he got 15, so we got unfinished business there. But anyway, <laughs> um, oh, I'd love to catch him on that. Where's my $15, governor? But um, the point of my paper, and, and I'm not sure how these are being distributed, but I brought four copies for people who want to pick it up. Is that the question of, they call it the money question in the 19th century after the Civil War, uh, that was put on the table for national discussion by third parties. Uh, both the Democrats and Republicans, their major trends supported the gold standard. The currency was deflating the debts of farmers and business people were inflating, you know, it was, it was a drag on the economy. And they called it the Long Depression from 1873 to, I think it was 1896. And there was some ups and downs in there, but they called it the Long Depression. And so that's what these third parties uh, were coming up against. So several years ago at the American Monetary Institute Conference, they asked me to like make a presentation about this, you know, the greenbacks, because I think what the American Monetary Institute proposal is is basically a modern day version of the old greenback demand, which was what the farmer labor populist movement was raising there in the late 19th century. So what I did was go back and look at everybody's platforms and see how they phrased it. I'm not going to read all the platforms, I'm going to summarize them. Um, but I think one thing to realize is that these parties, and there was a series, you know, there was first uh, national labor reform and then Greenback, and then Greenback Labor, and then Union Labor, and then the People's Party. And you find the same people coming together every four years to form a national party around the presidential election, and in between, lots of uh, independent campaigns, independent of two parties, with a range of names. The ones I just mentioned, plus anti-monopoly, independent, just plain old labor. Uh, there was a lot of ferment. And, uh, you know, they did put the money question on the debate, and underneath them were movements, like the National Labor Party was really the first third party after the Republicans ascended as a third party and replaced the Whigs. Um, it was called the National uh, Labor Reform Union, and then they formed the National Labor Reform Party. And their central plank was monetary reform. And then behind the uh, Greenbackers, 
and uh, was the patrons of husbandry, or what we call the Grange. You know, that was the farmers who were forming cooperatives, and they had they got behind this monetary reform, and then the Knights of Labor, and finally the Farmers Alliances. What we think of more often when we think of populist movement, North and South, Black and White, a mass movement of millions of farmers and sharecroppers. And that was the base beneath the People's Party. And, uh, you know, they took the third party approach because they weren't getting what they needed from the major parties uh, by trying to go to them. Whether it was the cooperatives that the farmers in particular tried to farm, form, and they got uh, basically denied credit by the banks and the big, uh, you know, railroads wouldn't ship their uh, product or uh, sell them uh, or the merchants wouldn't sell them the things they were buying cooperatively, and they ran a lot of trouble, so they said we have to take political action. And so, you know, I think that's the lesson today for monetary reformers. American Monetary Institute was able to get Dennis Kucinich to put the NEED Act into Congress. I think he got John Conyers as a sponsor, and then they gerrymandered Kucinich out of a, a seat, and John Conyers was getting old anyway, and he's out. So now you're looking for somebody else to sponsor that kind of legislation. Uh, you need a third party to bring it forward. So, you said it's 15 minutes. I, how much have I used so I can get the time out of it? You know, about 42 easily. Five more minutes? Now you can buy it. See, you can seven. have 25. Because you Take seven? Okay. Uh, all right. <laughs> so, I just uh, read some excerpts from some of these platforms. You know, that first third party after the Civil War, uh, they thought. Working for wages, they called it wage slavery. And a lot of the free slaves said the same thing. They didn't want to go back to work for the man, the old man that, you know, that was their slave owner, and now they were supposed to get paid a wage to pick cotton. And they said, no, 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 we either want 40 acres and a mule, or if it's going to be a large operation, we want to do it cooperatively. And you can go back, and they tried. I mean, Jefferson Davis' brother sold the slaves of that plantation to Jefferson Bend. Uh, and they, were, they operated a cooperative. They ran that big plantation cooperatively until later on the Davis family collected on them because they couldn't meet the payments. But that was part of that whole period. And, and that was in the context of you know, the Redeemers violently taking power back from the Reconstruction governments. But that was the National Labor Union's, or National Labor Union's attitude. They wanted to form worker cooperatives. And they thought getting a public currency instead of banknotes issued by private banks was the way to make sure there was sufficient supply of money in the economy so they could finance their cooperatives. And the Greenback Party of 1876, similar ideas. Uh, you know, when we think today when we talk about, you know, 100% reserve, reserve banking instead of fractional reserve banking, um, it's more checkbook money. But back then, private banks issued banknotes, and it was a competing currency with Greenbacks that were still circulating from the Civil War. And, uh, you know, their critique was the banknotes, uh, they could speculate and create bubbles, but also uh, they weren't issuing enough currency to uh, meet the needs of the economy. And that's why we had that long depression. So, uh, Greenback Labor Party in 1880 was very significant. General Weaver from the Union side of the Civil War ran. He ran in the South against the repeal of Reconstruction, insisted on integrated crowds, they had to have arms to protect those meetings, and uh, they really fought. He got 3.3% of the uh, vote, and, you know, their plank that year said, <coughs> all money should be issued as volume controlled by government, not by or through banking corporations. And that was basically the core of these planks, which you can follow from, you know, the 1870s right up into the 1930s. Uh, and in 84, the, you know, in the, in the plank that the Greenback Party had that year was, you know, substitution of Greenbacks for national banknotes. Those are banknotes issued by national banking corporations. Uh, and you go through 1888, it was the Union Labor Party. It was the, the, these are the same people. They just kept changing the name. Mm -hmm. They come together for presidential races, kind of fall apart, go back home. And then come back and have another convention in four years. Uh, and that year was union labor. So they wanted all money issued directly to the people without the intervention of banks. And the big one that most people know about when they think of the populist movement was the People's Party, 1892. Weaver, who had been the Greenback candidate, was now the People's Party candidate. 
and he got 22% of the vote, a million votes, I'm sorry, 8.5% of the votes, a million votes, five states, 22 electoral votes. It's uh, the best a third party uh, did in that post-Civil War period. And, uh, you know, the People's Party called for a national currency issued by government only without the use of banking corporations. Uh, now, the socialists who had been part of this former labor populist movement broke off that year, the Socialist Labor Party, and they had a very succinct platform uh, with the Greenback Demand, the United States to have the exclusive right to issue money. Uh, 1896, unfortunately, the People's Party uh, had a nice Greenback plank, but then they endorsed William James Bryan, who was no Greenbacker. He was doing the silver, you know, pre silver panacea with the backing of Hearst and, and silver miners. And uh, that was really the end of the People's Party as a third party. It hung on for a few uh, elections, and, you know, they still had the same demand, but as we went into the 20th century, Greenbackism kind of faded uh, because the socialists, the Social Labor Party had that plank 1892, 1896. They got kind of sectarian. They're mostly German exiles. They don't want to be more Marx than Marx. Marx and Engels were really mad at them for that. And uh, so Eugene Debs formed the Social Democratic Party and the Socialist Party, which became the big socialist movement. But they never incorporated the Greenback plank, which Debs was very familiar with. They talked about running Debs in 1896 as an independent candidate. He wasn't ready for that yet. Um, and I, you know, wondered, I haven't seen any contemporary discussion, but I wondered why uh, the socialists didn't carry that demand forward. And I think what they decided was, well, if we socialize the banks, we'll socialize the creation of money. And I'd be interested in seeing some discussion. I've seen more recently, I'll mention it in a, a bit. But, uh, so the People's Party, the rump of the People's Party, uh, kept running candidates in 1900, 1904, and 1908, not getting many votes. Uh, but the Greenback demand found an echo in uh, Teddy Roosevelt's progressive, uh, uh, Bill Moose's progressive campaign in 1912. He kind of pushed aside the father who got the movement started and was more conservative, but their plank in 1912 said uh, issuing notes through private agencies is harmful. Remember, the Federal Reserve didn't get formed until the next year. Uh, currency is fundamentally a government function. That's one of the statements in their plank. And they say, we are opposed to the so-called Aldrich Currency Bill, which set up the commission that eventually formed the Federal Reserve. So within populism, progressivism was more a middle class movement, but also uh, incorporated a lot of those farmers in the upper Midwest. So it had a continuation with populism. It was not as radical as the socialists. They were more the urban labor people and the rural and middle class professionals and farmers and so forth were more the progressives. But that greenback plank continued, that tradition continued, and particularly in the state-based uh, nonpartisan farm labor progressive parties in the upper Midwest, which by the 30s, I mean, they had like uh, four senators, 13 members of Congress, two governors, and they were a real threat to Roosevelt in 36, leading up to 36. Uh, so in 24, La Follette was the progressive candidate, and his plank said direct public control of the nation's money and credit. So, you know, that continued. The farmer labor platform was kind of carrying on the old People's Party, and they ran very low vote campaigns, but had greenback planks in 28 and 32. And really, the last gasp of the 20th century was the uh, Union Party in 1936, which was kind of a strange amalgam. See, when these progressives and farmer labor rights and nonpartisans in the upper Midwest were talking third party and 33, 34. Remember, Roosevelt's first one deal was not very progressive. It was fascistic in terms of the Blue Eagle and the cartels and the coordination of pricing and whatnot. It was not the Labor Relations uh, Act. It was not the Fair Labor Standards Act. It was not Social Security. That was the second new deal leading up to 36, which I think was partly in response to this potential third party challenge, which the Democratic National Committee polled for and found out Roosevelt would not win the election if uh, you know a third party populist third party ran. So you had those progressives in the upper Midwest. You had the people around Huey Long, you know, who were southern populists, still segregationists. You had Father Coughlin, who was anti-Semitic, you know, but he was mobilizing Catholic people 
on an economic populism, even if it was reactionary in other respects. And in the end, the guy that we're talking about running, the governor of uh, Minnesota, uh, Lafollette. Hmm? Lafollette. No, it wasn't Lafollette. Um, his kids, it was uh, Floyd Olson. Olson. He got stomach cancer and died. Uh, Huey Long got assassinated. And things kind of split up. Plus, Roosevelt co opted the labor movement. There was a whole labor party movement, a lot of resolutions by those unions, the new CIO unions, but also some AFL unions. And so it fell apart, but the rump state, they ran a progressive Republican from Idaho and a labor lawyer from Massachusetts called the Union Party. They got 2% of the vote. Uh, it was a landslide for Roosevelt. They didn't split it. They weren't spoilers. The Republicans were pretty much out of favor after Hoover. But anyway, they had a plan that said, Congress and Congress alone shall coin it and issue currency and regulate the value of money and credit in the United States through a central bank of issue. So that, that was the old greenback demand kind of updated for the era of the Federal Reserve. And then nobody talked about it, you know, until the Green Party brought it back. And we have a plank now, but, and I didn't even realize this when we talked at the American Monetary Institute, but in 2000, it was being discussed. I mean, I was involved in uh, groups that were trying to fight deindustrialization, and there were monetary reformers coming there, and I started learning about it. And so we had a plank in the Green Party USA, which was one of two national factions we were fighting back then. And it said, uh, the title of the plank was Democratize Money, po Monetary Policy, and the Federal Reserve System. And then it said, place a 100 reserve requirement on demand deposits in order to return control of monetary policy from private bankers to elected government. And that core demand was there. So now that plank, Nader didn't run on that platform. He ran on the other party's platform. And we, mo we all supported Nader. So, but it was in the air, part of the discussion. And then in 2010, the Greens adopted uh, a similar plank. Uh, basically, they talk about nationalizing the 12 reserve banks, reconstituting them and the Federal Reserve System, uh, System's Washington Board of Governors under a new monetary authority within the U.S. Treasury, which is what the American Monetary Institute's been talking about. And uh, talks about 100% reserve banking. And, uh, and then the UK Greens, the what were really the technically the, the Green Party of Britain and Wales, or Wales and Britain. England. Hmm? England and Wales. England and Wales, thank you. Um, and so they also have a plan. And so, so that's sort of been the history of this thing. And I'm no monetary expert, I'm still learning. I've been recently, you know, the MMT people have come forward, and I found this very interesting because they're very dismissive of the. And, my American Monetary Institute type of uh, monetary reform, and to find that they're, you know, sort of gray eminence. Minsky was talking about public money in 100 foot. I got to get that paper and read it. I didn't know the Greens had it. So that's, you know, very interesting. I, it may come into this conference worth it already. Um, and then there are the Marxists who say, yeah, you can control the money, but if you don't have control in an economic plan of the major means of production, uh, you really don't have control of the value of money. And uh, I've been wrestling with that. And so, you know, I sort of end this paper with a question, okay. Um, I have a quote from Rosa Luxemburg, for those socialists know she was uh, one of our uh, great leaders and heroines and martyrs. And she said, for social democracy, there exists an indis indissoluble tie between social reforms and revolution. The struggle reforms is its means. The social revolution is goal. In other words, I would say to those socialists who say, ah, you know, monetary reform is just a gimmick, a panacea. Uh, you can't do anything unless you get the whole socialist package. Uh, I would quote Rosa Luxemburg at them and say, you know, fighting for these reforms is how you build a revolutionary movement to really transform the whole thing. Um, and I'm still wrestling in my mind with, okay, so we do get a monetary authority inside the U.S. Treasury, but uh, and the banks have to do 100 reserve, 100 reserve spending, but say ExxonMobil, Coke Industries are still, um, you know, in charge of energy. They're not going to reinvest their earnings in renewables. They're going to reinvest it in fossil fuels and burn the planet. Um, so, how that all fits together is a question. So, I'll just leave these papers up here, and uh, I think I 
Thank you, Holly. Thank you.